the American people can respect their president, pray for their president, even have a strong affection for him, and still have an honest difference of opinion as to the merits of some of his programs. Another recent development has been the call for national unity. I believe there needs to be unity in our land, but it must not be a blind, senseless, irresponsible unity. It should not be a unity just for the sake of unity. It needs to be a unity built on sound principles. We Americans have strayed far from sound principles, morally, constitutionally, and historically. It has been getting us into a quagmire of trouble all over the world, and especially here at home. Americans at the grassroots level have sensed that their way of life is being threatened. During the last several years, there has been a rising tide of resistance to the prevailing political trend. Comp compromises with communism abroad and flirtations with socialism at home have stirred up opposition in both political parties. If this has left sound constitutional principles on which we can unite, there would be no virtue in calling for unity to support certain legislation if the majority of Americans were opposed to it. And the fact that both Democrats and Republicans in Congress have at times resisted certain legislation shows that the executive branch of the government may get out of step with the people. I believe the American people know what they want. It would appear that the people want their civil rights safeguarded, but not a destruction of states' rights. The farmers want opportunity for reasonable income security, but not agricultural dictatorship security. Parents want better school for their children, but not a federal subsidy leading to control of the teachings and textbooks as well as the ideologies of the children. People want sound pay-as-you-go spending with a balanced budget, not reckless spending and tax cuts with an unbalanced budget. If there is a need for urban renewal, people want it under local direction, not under the red tape of Washington bureaus armed with confiscatory powers over property. People want the development of power dams, but not the strangulation of privately owned power companies, which have proven far more efficient and economical than utilities run by the government. In other words, there are some legitimate functions and services which the federal government can and should provide. But those who want the federal power to exceed the authority delegated to it by the Constitution will be resisted both by Democrats and Republicans. This is what is happening in some limited areas today. May the trend increase. And anyone who tries to equate this love of constitutional principles as meaning hatred of our national leaders is using Goebbels-style deception. History has already demonstrated that conservative opposition to national leaders was not hate, but an attempt to do them a favor. Let me give you some examples. Was it hate when General Albert C. Wedemeyer pleaded with General Marshall and President Truman to reverse their policy before they lost China? Was it hate when Whitaker Chambers tried to warn President Roosevelt in 1939 that Alger Hiss had been giving the Soviet Union more espionage data than any other member of the Washington spy network? Was it hate when J. Edgar Hoover tried to warn President Truman that Harry Dexter White was a member of the Soviet spy apparatus and was doing great danger to the nation as a assistant secretary of the treasury? Was it hate when I went to the secretary of state under President Eisenhower and pleaded with him not to support the communist Fidel Castro? Was it hate when I urged the president of the United States to go to the aid of the brave freedom fighters in Hungary? 
Was it hate when the Democratic senator from Connecticut, Thomas Dodd, pleaded for two years with the president not to support the United Nations bloodbath against the free people of Katanga? Is it hate when distinguished military leaders advise that an all-out effort could end the Vietnam's struggle almost overnight? This list of acts by well-meaning citizens who want and wanted to prevent their presidents from making serious mistakes could be extended at length. But they would all illustrate the same point. History will show that many terrible mistakes occurred because the advice of these well-informed and well-meaning citizens was not heeded. Therefore, I repeat, this kind of resistance to a national leader is rooted in love and respect, not hate. Regardless of which political party is in power, you do not want to see your president make a serious blunder. You don't want him to lose China. You don't want him to allow the enemy agents to make fools of us. You don't want him to lose Cuba. You don't want him to suffer the, hum the humiliation of a Bay of Pigs disaster or allow a Soviet Gibraltar to be built 90 miles from our shores. Every one of these events, which have been so disastrous and which have destroyed freedom for hundreds of millions of our allies, could have been prevented. And the voices of those who tried to warn Washington of what was coming cannot be attributed to hate. It has been out of a love for our country and respect for our leaders that the voice of warning has been raised. What causes one to wonder is why these warnings were not carefully considered and acted upon. Why is it that men in high places in government, regardless of party, have been deceived? I am convinced that a major part of the cause can be justly laid at the door of the socialist communist conspiracy, which is led by masters of deceit who deceive the very elect.